Hello everyone. I hope you guys are feeling civil procedure today because we will be drafting a simple summons together. You know this already, but a summons is a court-issued document, the service of which commences the litigious process. There are three types of summonses, namely the simple summons, combined summons, and provisional sentence summons. We will be drafting a combined and provisional sentence summons in due course, whereas today we will be drafting a simple summons. In terms of Rule 17, Subsection 2 of the Uniform Rules of Court, and Rule 5, Subsection 2b of the Magistrate's Court Rules, the simple summons may be issued where the claim is founded on a debt or liquidated demand. For more theoretical information on the simple summons, check out the episode linked in the top right corner. Before we start, remind yourself that a simple summons must contain the following particulars. A brief explanation of the cause of action, a reference to the court's jurisdiction, a reference to the party's locus standi, a legal conclusion drawn from the material facts in issue, and a request for legal relief. Okay, let's start. But before we do, please make sure you're subscribed. The Magistrate's Court Simple Summons. The heading. First things first, make 100% sure that the court out of which you are proceeding has jurisdiction. If you're unsure about jurisdiction, check out the above video. Next, let's draft the summons heading. I like to use Arial 12 font with 1.5 cm line spacing. First, make sure the court citation is correct. In our example, we'll be proceeding out of the Ruhrdeport Magistrates Court. Make provision for the case number at the top right hand side of your summons under the court's citation. We now need to identify the parties. Remember, there can be several plaintiffs and or defendants, but in our example, we'll only have one of each. If there are several, they will be cited as first plaintiff, second plaintiff, first defendant, second defendant, etc. The plaintiff will obviously be your client. After the phrase, in the matter between, insert the plaintiff's full names and ID number if they are a natural person, and registration number if they are a company. If any party is acting in a nominated or other capacity, for example a trustee, put the letters NO after their name. Take note that the parties will not always have a registration or ID number. For example, they could have a passport number or a license number, depending on the citizenship of the person or the nature of the entity. Put plaintiff to the right of the plaintiff's details. Below and insert the defendant's details. Include the relevant number of the defendant, whether it be ID, registration, passport, etc. Take note that inserting the party's numbers, ID or otherwise, is not strictly necessary. However, you may encounter difficulties blacklisting the defendant with the relevant credit bureaus in instances where the relevant number is omitted. If you have the information on hand, use it. Insert a line across the page. You now have your heading. Your heading will look similar to the following. In our example, both the plaintiff and the defendant are natural persons. The instruction to the sheriff. Essentially, the summons is an instruction to the sheriff having jurisdiction. Therefore, below the horizontal line, type to the sheriff or his or her deputy. What do we need the sheriff to do? Well, we need the sheriff to inform the defendant of certain particulars in the summons, after which we need him to serve a copy thereof on them. Right, so go ahead and instruct the sheriff to inform. Next, we need to tell the sheriff who he is informing. I like to give the sheriff more as opposed to less information on the defendant. When I say more, I don't mean that you must tell the sheriff who the defendant's uncle is. The magistrate's court's rules set out what needs to be included in the defendant's citation, namely the surname and first names or initials of the defendant by which the defendant is known to the plaintiff, the defendant's residence or place of business and, where known, the defendant's occupation and employment address, and if the defendant is sued in any representative capacity, such capacity. Okay. So in our example, the sheriff is to inform Dorian Gray, identity number you can insert there. That's the surname and first names. I included the ID number for extra measure. A major male teacher, so we've identified occupation. I also add the defendant's gender and the fact that they are a major. Whose full and further particulars are to the plaintiff unknown. I always include such a sentence just to let the court know that I've included all the information I have on the defendant in the citation with employment address at Happy Feet Schools, 123 Clip Road, Johannesburg, counting 2194. There's the employment address. And residential address at Mont Blanc, 
125 Clip Road, Johannesburg, Gauteng 2194. There's a residential address. Being addresses within the jurisdiction of the above honourable court, in brackets, the defendants. Our paragraph setting out the defendant's details will look as follows. You'll note that we have indicated that the aforementioned addresses fall within the jurisdiction of the court. Jurisdiction can be confirmed elsewhere in the summons in a separate paragraph. But when the court has jurisdiction based on the residence of the defendant, we like to include it in the defendant's citation. In a combined summons, you will only confirm jurisdiction in the particulars of claim. If you want to confirm jurisdiction in a separate paragraph, simply do so before you set out the particulars of your claim, which we'll get to now. It is important to note the following magistrate court rules when it comes to confirming a court's jurisdiction in a simple summons. Where the defendant is cited under the jurisdiction conferred upon the court by section 28 subsection 1d of the Act, contain an averment that the whole cause of action arose within the district or region, and set out the particulars in support of such averment. Where the defendant is cited under the jurisdiction conferred upon the court by section 28 subsection 1g of the Act, contain an averment that the property concerned is situated within the district or region, and show any abandonment of part of the claim under section 38 of the Act, and any set-off under section 39 of the Act. If there is more than one defendant, you will cite the first defendant, and then simply cite the second defendant in the same manner, and so on. This is what your summons will look like. You then need to indicate to the sheriff who has instituted the action. In terms of the magistrate's court rules, when citing the plaintiff, you must include the following information insofar as the information is available to you. The full names, gender, if the plaintiff is a natural person, and occupation and the residence or place of business of the plaintiff, and if the plaintiff sues in a representative capacity, such capacity. The citation of the plaintiff in our example will look as follows. If there is more than one plaintiff, you'll just do the same thing you did if there were two defendants, except it would be in respect to the plaintiff. Simply put, you will instruct the sheriff to inform the defendant that X, cite the party, and Y, cite the party. This is what a summons with two plaintiffs will look like. The next step is to set out the particulars of the plaintiff's claim in concise terms. In our example, let's say the plaintiff's claim is for 50,000 Rand for services rendered, and despite demand, the defendant has failed and or refused to make payments. You'll start by stating, hereby institutes action against the defendant, in which action the plaintiff's claim is for. Now we need to briefly discuss the plaintiff's claim. We need to mention the following to ensure the claim makes sense. Payments in the amount of 50,000 Rand, for services rendered by the plaintiff, which services were requested by the defendant, that the defendant, notwithstanding demand, fails and or refuses to pay. We must then annex a copy of the letter of demand and an invoice or statement reflecting the amount due as A and B. You do not need to attach every document in your possession to the simple summons. If you receive a notice of intention to defend after the sheriff has served the summons, you'll need to deliver a declaration which will set out your claim in much greater detail and to which the relevant annexes will be attached. The paragraph setting out the particulars of your client's claim should look as follows. Take note that the amended Magistrates Court Rule 5 provides that where a cause of action is based on a contract, the plaintiff shall indicate whether the contract is in writing or oral, when, where and by whom it was concluded. And if the contract is in writing, a copy thereof or of the part relied on shall be annexed to the simple summons. For interest's sake, such a paragraph would look as follows. What's also important is to double check whether any of the following magistrate court rules are applicable to your summons and to comply with said rules. Where the plaintiff issues a simple summons in respect of a claim regulated by legislation, the summons may contain a bare allegation of compliance with the legislation but the declaration, if any, must allege full particulars of such compliance. A summons for rent under Section 31 of the Act shall be in the form prescribed in Annex 1, Form 3 to the Magistrate's Court Rules. This is known as a rent interdict summons, which we will discuss in a future episode. Where the plaintiff sues a sessionary, the plaintiff shall indicate the name, address and description of the sedent at the date of session, as well as the date of the session. These rules are simple, so just do what they say and you'll be fine. So we have now set out the brief particulars of our claim. Next, we need to insert the relief sought. In the next paragraph, you will state, wherefore the plaintiff prays for judgment against the defendant in the sum of 50,000 Rand 
together with interest thereon at the rate of 7% per annum et tempora more, plus cost of suit. You may also set your relief out in the following format. Wherefore, the plaintiff prays for judgment against the defendant in the following terms, and then list your prayers from A to D. Take note that the rate of interest and scale of cost sought may differ, usually depending on whether an agreement is in place and the specific terms thereof. Also note, the prescribed rate of interest often changes, so make sure you're inserting the actual prescribed rate when no specific interest rate was agreed upon between the parties. The prescribed rate of interest is mainly affected by changes in the repo rate. What you have just seen on the screen is what your prayers should look like. There are further instructions that we need to give the sheriff, and one of those are that he is to inform the defendant that if he wishes to defend the matter, he may serve a notice of intention to defend within 10 days and file it in court. In this instruction, the court's address must be clearly set out. The sheriff must also inform the defendant that the notice of intention to defend must set out an address at which the defendant will accept the service of future notices and pleadings in terms of Rule 13, subsection 3. The address provided will usually be the defendant's attorney's offices. The defendant must be informed that failure to serve a notice of intention to defend may result in judgment being granted against him without further notice. This is known as default judgment. Finally, as mentioned earlier on, the sheriff must be instructed to actually serve the summons on the defendant once he has been informed of its contents. The sheriff will show the defendant the original summons and hand a copy thereof to him. Once the sheriff has complied with the above instructions, he must provide the plaintiff with the return of service. This instruction is worded quite weirdly in the summons. Word this part as follows. And immediately thereafter, serve on the defendant a copy of the summons and return the same to the clerk of the court with whatsoever you have done thereupon. A small reminder that in the district court they have clerks and in the regional court they have registrars. The final few sheriff instructions will look as what I've been showing you. In terms of magistrate's court rule 5 subsection 3b, a plaintiff may indicate in the summons whether he would be prepared to receive all further notices and pleadings in the suit in a manner other than physical or postal delivery. What this provision is really saying is that the plaintiff may indicate that he is willing to accept service via email. I much prefer service via email, but make sure to always check your junk folder. If you wish to accept service via email, you will simply state as follows. Kindly take note that, in terms of Rule 5, subsection 3b, the plaintiff is prepared to accept and prefers the following manner of service of all subsequent documents, pleadings, and notices in this action. By electronic mail to lawyerzda at gmail.com, quoting OMB123. Include your preferred email address and your office's reference number. If you don't already know, every single file that you open should have a different reference number. Signing off. Magistrate's Court Rule 5, subsection 3a states that every summons shall be signed by the attorney acting for the plaintiff and shall bear the attorney's physical address within 15 kilometers of the courthouse, the attorney's postal address, and where available, the attorney's fax and mail address, and electronic mail address. If no attorney is active for the plaintiff, the summons shall be signed by the plaintiff, who shall, in addition, append a physical address within 15 kilometers of the courthouse, at which the plaintiff will accept service of all subsequent documents and notices in the suit, the plaintiff's postal address, and where available, plaintiff's fax and mail address, and electronic mail address. After the above has been complied with, the summons shall be signed and issued by the clerk of the court and shall bear the date of issue by the clerk as well as the case number allocated thereto. Remember, it will be the registrar in the regional court. So, we simply need to indicate the date on and the place at which the summons was signed, after which provision must be made for signature by the plaintiff or the plaintiff's attorneys and the clerk. Remember to include all the information mentioned in the rules at the bare minimum. In our example, we are acting on behalf of the plaintiff, so this part of the summons will look as follows. Very important, which you should already know. If your offices are not within 15 kilometers of the courthouse, you need to appoint correspondent attorneys that are within 15 kilometers. All that this really means is that the defendant's attorneys may serve pleadings and notices on your correspondence instead of your offices. You can also instruct your correspondents to serve pleadings and notices on the defendants on your behalf. As the instructing attorneys, you will still do most of the work. It's just the exchanging of documents and filing in court that will be attended to by the correspondents. Think about a scenario where your offices are based in Johannesburg, but the matter is proceeding out of Cape Town Magistrates Court. You will obviously need to appoint correspondent attorneys. 
Where you have appointed correspondent attorneys, you need to include their details in addition to your firm's details below the attorney's signature. This looks as follows. The Magistrate's Court rules also require the following, which is not required in the High Court. A form of consent to judgment, a form of appearance to defend, a notice drawing the defendant's attention to the provisions of Section 109 of the Act, and a notice in which the defendant's attention is directed to the provisions of Sections 57, 58, 65A and 65D of the Act, in cases where the action is based on a debt referred to in Section 55 of the Act. I am not going to go through each of the above with you, but rather show you what this section should look like. I will also be providing a template of the summons, so don't stress. Finally, you need to create a table in which you'll indicate, in terms of tariff, the cost for issuing summons as well as judgment costs. The table in our example looks as follows. The amounts reflected in the column will differ from matter to matter depending on the quantum of the relief sought. Make sure you check the tariffs. Simple summons in the High Court. As mentioned, the format of the simple summons to be issued in the High Court differs ever so slightly to the Magistrate's Court summons. But let's go through it. The heading. The heading will be exactly the same, save for the court's citation. We are now proceeding in the High Court. For our example, let's proceed out of the Pretoria High Court. The court's citation will be the following. In the High Court of South Africa, Gauteng Division, Pretoria. Again, make sure you know how to cite the court out of which you are proceeding. The parties are going to remain the same in our High Court example. The instruction to the Sheriff. The instruction to the sheriff to inform the defendant that the plaintiff institutes action against him, including the citation of the defendant and plaintiff, will remain exactly the same. The uniform rules of court and magistrate's court's rules require the same information to be included in the party's citation. If there is more than one defendant and or plaintiff, you will do exactly what we did in our magistrate's court summons. After the citation of the parties, we need to set out the brief particulars of our claim. So as we did with the Magistrate's Court Summons, insert the following. Hereby institutes action against the defendant in which action the plaintiff's claim is for. Let's change the amount claimed to 500,000 Rand to bring it in line with the monetary jurisdiction of the High Court. However, if you watched our last episode on jurisdiction, you would remember that the High Court has concurrent jurisdiction with the Magistrate's Court. So even if your claim is for 50,000 Rand, you may still proceed out of the High Court. In light of the above, the only change to the particulars of our claim will be the amount due to the plaintiff by the defendant. We will once again annex a copy of the letter of demand and an invoice slash statement reflecting the amount due as annexure A and B. As is the case in the Magistrate's Court, if you receive a notice of intention to defend, you will need to deliver a declaration to which all the important annexures will be attached. Our particulars will look as follows. There is no specific uniform rule which requires the plaintiff to confirm the court's jurisdiction in the simple summons. Do it anyway. Draft a separate paragraph briefly stating why the court has jurisdiction. There is also no rule requiring the plaintiff to allege compliance with specific legislation where the claim is based thereon. Regardless, briefly allege compliance. Take note further that you may not issue a rent interdict summons in the High Court. As you now know, next we need to insert the relief sort. So, in the next paragraph, you will state... Wherefore, the plaintiff prays for judgment against the defendant in the sum of 500,000 Rand, together with interest thereon at the rate of 7% per annum, et tempora more, plus cost of suit. You may also set your relief out in the alternative A to D format. As we did in the Magistrate's Court summons, we need to instruct the sheriff to inform the defendant that if he wishes to defend the matter, he may serve a notice of intention to defend within 10 days and file it in court. As we are proceeding out of a different court, the address will not be the same. The sheriff must also inform the defendant that the notice of intention to defend must set out an address at which the defendant will accept the service of future notices and pleadings in terms of Rule 19, Subsection 3. In the Magistrate's Court, it's Rule 13, Subsection 3. 
Take note that this paragraph is worded slightly different in the High Court, which will be evident when I show you our example. The defendant must again be informed that failure to serve a notice of intention to defend may result in judgment being granted against it without further notice. And finally, we will instruct the sheriff to actually serve a copy of the summons. And finally, we will instruct the sheriff to actually serve a copy of the summons on the defendant after explaining the contents thereof. We will word this paragraph in the same way we did in our magistrate's court summons, except that the sheriff is to serve on the defendant a copy of the summons and return the same to the registrar of the court, not the clerk. The final few sheriff instructions look as follows. We will again indicate on the summons that we are prepared to accept the service of all future pleadings and notices via email. It will be in terms of Rule 17, Subsection 3D, as it is the uniform rules of court that apply here, and not the Magistrate's Court's rules. Remember, if you would prefer to exchange pleadings and notices via hand, leave out this paragraph. If you wish to accept pleadings and notices via hand, state. If you wish to accept pleadings and notices via email, state. Kindly take note that. In terms of Rule 17, subsection 3D, the plaintiff is prepared to accept and prefers the following manner of service of all subsequent documents, pleadings, and notices in this action by electronic mail to lawyerza at gmail.com, quoting OMB 123. Signing off. Rule 17, subsection 3 states that every summons shall be signed by the attorney acting for the plaintiff and shall bear an attorney's physical address within 15 kilometers of the office of the registrar the attorney's postal address, and where available, the attorney's facsimile address and email address. It further states that if no attorney is acting, the summons shall be signed by the plaintiff, who shall in addition append an address within 15 kilometers of the office of the registrar, at which the plaintiff will accept service of all subsequent documents in the suit, the plaintiff's postal address, and where available, plaintiff's facsimile and electronic mail address. After the above has been complied with, the summons shall be signed and issued by the registrar of the court. So, once we have indicated the date and the place at which the summons was signed, we will sign off the same way we did in our Magistrate's Court summons, except the signature for the registrar will be before the signature of the plaintiff's attorneys. It doesn't have to be set out this way, but we try to keep our summons looking as similar as possible to the prescribed form next to the rules. Okay, here's where the two courts mostly differ. You will recall that the Magistrate Court rules also requires a form of consent to judgment, a form of appearance to defend, uh, notice drawing the attention to section 109 and section 57, 58, 65a and so on. The above is not required in the High Court, nor is the tariff required. Therefore, we are done with the High Court summons. So that concludes our episode. We now know how to draft the simple summons in both the Magistrates Court and the High Court. I've been ever so kind and I have left a Google Drive link uh, where you can access templates of both the Magistrates Court and the High Court Simple Summons. Um, but you can only do so if you subscribe. Thanks, guys.